excited. The first thing in the lessons learned is you've got to choose your partners well. And so I have a partner here who has quickly become a good friend. And when you're talking on Christmas Eve and Easter and, you know, all those other fun times, you certainly um, get to know a lot about each other. So um, Barbara is the executive director of the Leesville Housing Authority, and she's also the property manager at Twin Lakes of Leesville. And um, if you don't know where Leesville is, anybody doesn't know where Leesville is? Did anybody heard of Fort Polk? Right, Fort Polk. It's in Vernon Parish. It's a rural community, and that's what we're talking about, how to do big things in small communities. So uh, a, a few years ago, HUD actually changed and implemented this program called RAP, the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program. And we're going to talk about that today, but I want people in the room who are not a housing authority or who um, are not familiar with public housing to just think about this as a rehab project with project-based vouchers. Because at the end of the day, that's really what it is. It's a voucher real estate transaction, any, like any other type of transaction that might have a subsidy with it. Um, so, leveraging resources. You have to be really creative in small communities. I hear these big developers get on these panels and talk about what they're doing in New York and New Orleans and all these big towns, and they're like, oh, the costs are so expensive. And I'm like, hey, come to the rules part of the United States because it is expensive there and you also even have to work to find what contractor will come and work in your community when you do not have a hotel or anywhere to house your labor. So there's all kinds of challenges in the rural community that um, the, the big city doesn't face. So some of the things that we worked through were utilities and savings. How many of you can look at utility allowances or your projects and think, wow, we have money that's literally going out the window, right? Do any of y'all think about that? Yes, yes. I think there has to be some kind of national policy on what are we doing with utilities, because I call it, we're giving it away. We're giving it away and we're not making the cons um, concerted effort to really try to do conservation. Well, one of the things that we were able to do in um, Leesville is actually lower the utility allowances. The Leesville Housing Authority was the first in the country, yes sir, Louisiana, led by Leesville, woohoo, first in the country to utilize what was called a utility allowance waiver. Um, that provision was used in RAD, but it is actually a provision that if you do work in the project-based voucher world, you can actually utilize. It's an engineered methodology where people actually engineer, look at what each unit is going to consume based on what systems are in place, and those are expensive. They're not just a regular utility allowance, they're an engineered utility allowance. So they're a little pricey, but if they can help bring your utility costs down, what are you doing? You're collecting more rent, right? You're not throwing money out the window. I believe on ours it was sixty-six thousand dollars a year. You guys add that up. I mean, just to say that it's a savings is not just a savings. But when you hear the numbers, I mean, how many of us have sixty-six thousand dollars? We just like to go out the window. That's a huge, huge savings. That's absolutely right. So sixty-six thousand dollars. You can think for those John Rutgers in the world who can do numbers in their head. You can think about, oh, that could leverage this much more in debt. So, um, so just have to think about those things. And then, of course, there's also cost to all the systems that you're putting in. Now, we were not doing a minor rehab. There were 195 units, and it was a substantial rehab. Um, and so we're really impacting those building systems, hot water heaters, windows, <coughs> insulation, new electrical uh, circuits, because we wanted to modernize and bring things that had to have more ampage and more, uh, and I'm not the technical architect you can see. So all of those things have to change. Um, in this particular case, Barbara, tell them about what you had been doing with gas. So in our housing authority, because we were established in 1968, the housing authority maintenance staff was actually, we were a, considered a gas distributor. So therefore, when the state would come in or new state regulations, guess who had to come comply with them? And, and it was our staff. So we were a master's gas distributor. I don't know how many of you 
guys would like to do it, but I'm certainly telling you that the Housing Authority did not want to be in the gas business. So with this conversion, the Housing Authority no longer has to comply with the state, and we actually worked out a partnership agreement with Centerpoint, and now we were out of the gas business, and the people who should be in the gas business themselves is Centerpoint. Now they have taken over their system, and we actually got new lines from them, and we installed new master meters, risers, and everything. So our gas system got upgraded. The housing Authority didn't put a whole lot of money into it, and we've got out of the business. So you know, it, it reduces our liability totally. So the, the, just to kind of take a little spin on that, so working with utility companies can be difficult, to say the least. Um, they also are very regulated, and so you really have to start early having these conversations. But remember, they also answer to the Public Service Commission. So just think about what kind of things are coming out in terms of policy out of Public Service Commission. How can you leverage it? Do you have somebody from your community that's on the board? <laughs> Um, so those are also really helpful tools. Now, in this particular case, gas was the lower utility for cooking and heating. And so you also want to make sure to look at that. I know a lot of people just say, oh, make it all electric. Well, if you really are going to have resident paid utilities and you're going to have a utility allowance in our communities, um, you really want to think about what's the gas and what's the gas cost because a little bit more in installation up front you can really save a lot down the line. Um, and then any rebates that you're able to take as well. So just think through those. Um, taxes. So properties, real estate, you pay property taxes, correct? Everybody's familiar? We all have it. Everybody in here should raise their hand that they pay taxes. Sometimes the taxes. Well, um, so Barbara I, and I, I looked at her and I said, oh my gosh, your roads are really bad. Who owns these roads? Oh, those are the city roads. And I'm like, oh, they're really bad. We've got to go talk to the mayor and see what the city's going to do about these roads. Because we can't put in these ramps and, and really have things that meet ADA. The mayor was a very colorful mayor at that time. Very, very colorful. And um, we said, we sat down and we said, well, mayor, how are we going to get these roads fixed? We're putting this, you know, millions of dollars in and, well, we don't have any money. And so we suggested the pilot forgiveness. Go ahead. So what we did is we went to the city and um, Molly and I and a couple other people, but we did our background. We did our um, back beforehand. So we went and we went to every single council member first and we explained to them what we were projecting here, what our vision was. And we explained to them that, you know, here you're going to have this new facility with these new units in this right beautiful community and then you have to drive on these roads. So we asked them, you know, let's figure out a way that we can both agree on what we can do to solve a problem. So we went to them and we asked them and said, okay, you know, we have this pilot program and what we would think that would be the most economic for both parties in, in this situation is if we get a waiver on our pilot taxes for the next 15 years. So we, you know, you have to do your homework. We went up to the council and, you know, we thought we weren't going to get it at first. I mean, I thought we were going to get it, but there are some people that, you know, I was kind of a little shy about it. You know, it's new territory and so forth. But we went in there and, again, because we did our homework beforehand and we brought everyone to the table and we did a one-on-one -on -one and explained to them this fantastic program, what the RAC program is and what it's going to do for the community. And when we went up to the vote, we actually had a unique for the next 15 years that the city would, would um, waive our pilot taxes and then we could leverage that money to pay for the road repairs. But we decided to use the 538 loan program. We actually had two tranches to the loan and one was specifically based on the pilot forgiveness and it went to pay for the rent. Awesome, right? Problem solved. Check, check. Um, the other thing that we um, did were appliances. Okay, so if you have a nonprofit, if you have a maintenance group, if you own property and have a management company, you know, these, these are all things that you may be able to leverage. So Barbara's um, maintenance department was pretty familiar with putting in appliances. They did that all day and sometimes on Sunday, right? Correct. So um, to save money, um, we utilized the housing authority for the tax free purchase of the appliances. And then the Housing Authority actually was the contractor to install the appliances. 
and they installed at a, a discounted rate than what our general contractor um, installed. So we saved like $26,000 with the housing authority doing that. And it was some work and some um, money that the housing authority was able to um, do and make some non-federal dollars for, for them as well. So, I don't know. Startup funds. Startup funds. There you go. Startup for an exclusion. So then we get down to the bottom of the scope of work, right? Everybody has a scope of work when they're doing these projects. And what is always what goes out the window? Signage and landscaping, right? Landscaping is really, really important. That curb appeal and just having something really nice that creates that home and that defensible space is so important. And so we're down at the bottom of the, you know, Station work, thinking, okay, how are we going to make this work? We really want robust landscaping. And um, so we come up with this idea, and I'll let you talk about the. Um, so, what we did on the landscaping is the housing authority, again, because we can use our tax free um, exemption, and so we purchased thousands, thousands. And, you know, I was only going to do for a thousand, but again, my partner here, she's such an creative and intuitive person. And, you know, a thousand just wasn't enough for her because, you know, we have to think outside the box. We want everything to look pretty because the buildings look pretty, right? And then when you do it in front in, with somebody's home, you're giving them ownership because now look, not only do I have these <coughs> woodies out here, but now I have this beautiful drive. When people come to my house, it's very welcoming. And so what we did was we bought these these plants and we said, you know what, there is, this is way more than, you know, our staff can handle and so what we did was we put out a marketing strategy out to the community and we asked other people to come in and participate in the participation day. And so some of the people that had come was we actually had the New Orleans office, HUD office came in and they were present. We had lawyers, we had school organizations and we partnered with the school system so that these youth groups or these youth organizations that were within the junior high and high school the school system allowed them to use that for a community service. They got a certificate for participating, and they actually got an excuse for that day, and they can use that on their resume. And, you know, they actually taught us a few things, too, because, you know, obviously I'm not the best planner in the world, so, you know, I have to get some, you know, teaching on how deep you have to actually put a bush. And then we um, uh, reached out to our neighboring housing authorities, and they came in, and we actually spent an entire day with all kind of community leaders, community partners, school systems, residents. And residents, we did yes. have a bunch of residents. Actually, we probably had about 20 some residents. And um, one of my colleagues said, "Well, how did you get them out there? You know, you just talk to them and say, hey, look, would you like to help? Who doesn't want to help on a sunny, hot day in Louisiana to plant some plants? Really? So we had the young, the old, you know, the people in between. We had community leaders. We churches we had some, a couple of pastors that came through and so it was actually bringing everyone together and everyone buying into the system that the housing authority in the RAT program is good for the community so everybody got to really take a piece of the revitalization effort in the community which was really exciting we're here talking about you know money and leverage and certainly there was that factor but just think about the other factors how that impacted the project and the so um, we're at the same, the management was shared staff, so um, Barbara and um, a management company worked together. Uh, um, Barbara did not have any affordable housing tax credit experience, and so um, LHC and our investors and even us as developers want somebody who really understands that tax credit program. And um, so she'll talk a little bit about that in um, a, a next slide. And then. Um, the um, Housing Authority has done an amazing job over the years with volunteers for social services. So if you're doing a tax credit program and you're in a rural community, sometimes it's hard to find, you may not have that community college or you know those resources in your community to find the volunteers to come in. Fortunately, you'll see there's a gym here. They had a number one karate team for a while. Um, they have leveraged um, both home ownership programs, rural development, housing counseling, um, cooperative extension service. I always call those the 4-H agents in town. Um, so um, I'll let her talk a little bit more about that. And then also just really important to think about 
partnerships with city and county jurisdictions. So if you're in the city, don't forget that you have a county and they're supporting you as well. Lots of other ancillary things came through the county support, so that's important to note as well. Um, just to talk a little bit about the specific project, so um, the total development cost for this 195 units was um, 21 million. Um, we had Chase, LHC had soft funds, Leesville Housing Authority had both Housing Authority funds and then the Housing Authority, that looks like a big number, $6 million. Well, it's because they also had a seller take back note. So the Housing Authority actually sold the property to the partnership and then held a note which helped with acquisition credits and then out of cash flow, um, we'll be paying that loan back. So, has anybody seen this number lately? No, where are you going? That is exactly right. So, thank you. Actually, yes. We actually came into the project at a very, very good time during this because I know, I know that a dollar one, or I'm sorry, a dollar two is, is almost unheard of in today's, today's world. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, housing rehabilitation was the key, and then really and truly, um, the Housing Authority really was concerned about their neighborhood. So the um, Housing Authority has four different sites. So it's a scattered site project. It's all, not all on one particular piece of property. It's actually scattered in four kind of different areas of, of the community. Um, there was really um, not really um, cash besides a few of the dollars that the Housing Authority had that were um, you know, federally earmarked um, to do this transaction. Um, the most exciting thing to me about this particular project is that Leesville Housing Authority ha actually had some higher income families and um, there were about 28 that we called over income and of those 28, Barbara really worked with them to offer them other opportunities. So in this transition, there were folks who became homeowners. You want to talk just a minute? Yes. Yeah, so what we did was because the Leesville Housing Authority has a natural routine of working with rural development and doing home ownership programs, and so we have these um, uh, routine workshops once or twice a year. And so with that partnership, we continued to work with different banks, local banks, and rural development, and we were able to get um, at the very onset and. Um, Maybe I know you were kind of scratching it for just a little bit. But we ended up getting five families. At the very beginning, we had five families that went into home ownership. But since that time, we still had a couple of families that were still getting these annual payments because when, you're, when you go into the, the incentives, it's one payment per year for three years. We had a couple of people that were still on their third year. Um, Talk about the Uniform Relocation Act. I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you. And so we still had a couple of families kind of lingering out there and they still had a payment coming. Well, since then we had two additional families that went into home ownership and we were very excited that even though they didn't um, come on board at the very beginning because they just weren't ready, they weren't trained or their finances were not where they needed to be. And so we continued to work with them. And so now at those 28 families that we had that were over income, we seven of them actually went into home ownership, which was a very exciting for us because these are people who actually not just moved out into the community, but two families actually moved right across the street. So if you're one of your, if you're a housing project based voucher um, tenant and you see the neighbor who used to live to the left of you has now purchased a house right across the street for you. If they can do it, why can't I? Okay, so that's an encouraging step too for these other families to see if they can do it, I can do it too. And what I love about that story, okay, so seven, right? Seven. That may not sound a lot in, to all of you, but seven people, really it's 14 people that were just housed. Seven just became homeowners and that enabled seven more to move into the rental housing um, from the wait list. So, I mean, I think Barbara deserves a round of applause. That's hard work. So um, just to kind of go through, um, just so you can kind of see before and after, um, these were built in the 80s and probably the construction is not as good as some of the 1940s uh, stuff that we have across the state. Um, it was actually a turnkey project where a developer just came in, built it and said, here it is, good luck. Um, and we found some of that not so fortunate luck as we were doing the rehab. 
Um, but you can see very aesthetically a pleasing, um, really the housing authority, and you can think of this as your nonprofit partner, whomever your partner is, it's so important to have everybody involved, maintenance and management and residents to decide what is going to work. I just like to tell the little story about, um, you can see here at the bottom the rocks and you might think, oh wow, that looks really pretty and that looks really nice. Well, guess what? We decided that the maintenance folks were probably never gonna stop hitting the side of the building with the weed whacker <laughs> and we had to do something because we weren't gonna change their behavior. So guess what? They can't cut into these rocks. <laughs> weed whacker can go all day. So, but you can just see it's a really big transformation. This is the exact same unit in the same place, and it's big. And, um, and, and you'll also know, notice that the color schemes are different. So really important for people able to ha say, hey, this is my home, and be, you know, I'm in the red building, or I'm in the yellow building, and, um, or I have a red door, or, or whatever the case might be. So. Um, Major renovation, again, lighting, flooring, washers and dryers in the units, bringing amenities into the units is really important. You don't want to do a major rehabilitation project just to have people want to go down the street where they have more opportunities, you know? Washers and dryers for people who have kids, that's a big deal. You don't want to have to load up your kids and do homework at the laundry facility. I've done that. I've been there. It's a lot of trouble. So um, that, that's kind of a life changer. Barbara, tell just a minute, because I think it's worth um, telling about the resident that um, was handicapped and she wasn't in the right size unit and we specifically took a daycare that was in, not in use and rehabbed it for a three bedroom um, ADA. Tell, tell that story and I'm just gonna flip through so it. So what, what we had was we had a family that when they came into housing, they, there, there were no disabilities. And so we have a single mom, three, three children, and so she ends up getting sick and she goes to the hospital. Well, with the RAF program, um, it's not like the old HUD, there's different regulations, and some of them are quite uh, amazing, thoughtful. Because what the RAF program um, required was, instead of having 5% handicap per agency, now under the RAF program, you have to have 5% of your units per site to be handicap accessible. And that's Which, a project-based voucher rule too. So you have to have it by site, not city-wide. By site, exactly. And so what happened was is, is when these, um, when our handicapped units were um, earmarked when they were first constructed, you know, the majority of them were for the seniors and the single older families. So what this allowed is we converted and we increased our handicap units for those that are family-oriented, which have children. So this woman goes to the hospital, she becomes ill, and she actually gets her leg amputated. She gets um, Mercer and some other things, and now she's a bedridden individual. So the units that we had, she was not in a handicap unit, and there were none that existed within our agency. So we did the RAD conversion, she gets one of the handicap units, and now for a woman who was actually bedridden could not move out of her bedroom. She could not take care of her children because she was limited because she couldn't take a wheelchair down her hallway or she couldn't go and bathe you know she couldn't she didn't have a walk through or you know um, walk up shower or anything she just literally had to bathe out of a sink so now we have rad rehab and now she's able to cook for her family she's able to take care of with her children she's able to run a wheelchair down her hallway she's able to wash clothes and take care of her family the children now have a mother that can interact with their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And also, for you who have, uh, that are parents in this room, when the children start fighting, we have a mother who actually has a switch now. <laughs> so she can reach out and touch. But this, this increase the quality of this family, this woman, she now knows that, you know, she feels, it's just heartbreaking, but now she's a mother who can take care of her children and she's part of their daily lives instead of being stuck in a bedroom that she never moves off of the bed. Another really important thing um, in the small communities, everybody wants to know, well, how can we be part of this? Everybody wants to know that. Well, you may not be able to have, say, oh, well, the general contractor is going to come from here because you have to have experience, right? Um, but what you can do is meaningful outreach. You can do Section 3. And that's not, doesn't mean just public housing, that means affordable, that means low income. 
Go to the churches. Go to the social service entities. Go, you know, really have that outreach. Now, let me just tell you a little lesson learned. You can start the Section 3 early, but until the bulldozers and the hammers show up, nobody on the Section 3 side is really interested until they start seeing a, a con. So you need to do it twice. Um, minority contractor outreach, also very important. This is an opportunity for a lot of folks to get involved in um, projects, and that's a requirement. If you have CDBG, home, project-based voucher, any of those federal funds, you're required to do this. So why not do it in a substantial way? In Alexandria, Louisiana, um, not a rural community, but almost rural, we're, we're, we would like for it to be rural. Um, uh, we have a, a, a project that's kicking off, and this year, you know how you go to a sports, you see on TV they sports sign, you know, I'm signing with LSU, I'm signing with Southern. We're gonna have a contract signing. So we've got some young people who wanna come on board with a project. We're gonna have hats and we're gonna have an event. It's gonna be a construction sign. They're coming to work. Let's celebrate that too. College and sports isn't for everybody. Let's, let's celebrate the other wins in our community. So just again, some of the um, contract um, outreach. And then this is actually at the housing authority during, um, during the renovation. So um, Standard Enterprises is our partner um, with the Leesville Housing Authority, but the Leesville Housing Authority Board of Directors said if we do this conversion, we don't want to lose our staff. That's part of what they wanted to keep their folks employed. And so we said, okay, however, caveat, you know, you can't have people over overpaid that are overpaid for the position that the project can't support. You've got to have people that are willing to retrain. We had a clerk of the works end up doing uh, some occupancy type work. So you've got to be open to options. So, okay, and some of the things that I just wanted to bring to your attention is, is that when you have this relationship with the management company, we had a very good meeting on our first time out. Mandy um, Ports with Standard Enterprises, our management company, and they're represented today. But we sat down way before we even broke ground and we sat down and discussed what each other's visions are. And that's a very important thing to do. Another thing that you need to discuss on the forefront is your policies and your lease. Because remember the housing authority or the other agency that will be partnering with you has a different lease and a different mindset. So we need to make sure that the management um, lease and what your ideas is what you want to be incorporated in the lease is that you know what each other wants and hash that all out at the beginning. Another thing you need to talk about is negotiate the management agreement. You know, we talked ahead of time about the incentives, the expenses, and how decisions are made. So that you discuss all this on the forefront so that there are no surprises on the back end of it. And this way, everybody understands what the relationship and what the roles are. Uh, another thing is, is make sure that you do your training as soon as possible. That is very, very important. Because you know, time management is very important. And when you start and you break ground and you start just going after it, especially if you're an agency with a small staff, training doesn't seem like it may be as important as it needs to be, but it is extremely important. Um, Holly mentioned the staff and the timing. Um, on ours, we had lost our, um, our office and our, our administrative office and our maintenance all at one time. So then we had to figure out where we're going to be located at. Okay, so they lost it because we built a new one. <laughs> right, right, right. Actually, we were going to Jackson, Mississippi. However, we decided no, no. to stay. <laughs> so we had to figure out, you know, where was that staff going to be um, located at, where our staff was, the inner workings, and so forth. They were in the gym, and it was hot sometimes. No air conditioning, no heat for 15 months. Just putting it out there with maintenance department. You're all out in the open, and so. Thanks, Barbara. They're never going to work with me. <laughs> but that is the importance of having these discussions on the forefront. That's just one of those challenges that we know now that something you need to think about. File 21, that's very important because those are the permanent files, especially in the tax credit world. Um, make sure that you have standard operating procedures between the two agencies. And then, you know, just like we had discussed is we love you to death. However, we don't want to be with you forever. So we had discussed that there would be an exit plan. We would rediscuss this in year three, four, or five, you know, depending on how comfortable and how everything is. But it's, it's good to discuss these things at the forefront so everybody knows what their roles are and what the expectations are. So our salvage incentive. So what we did is we talked to the construction company. And we had an exceptionally good construction company. So what does construction companies do with all the stuff they pull out of the unit? They pay somebody to come pick it up and take it to wherever. 
Well, what we did is we discussed it with the construction company. They put the stuff out of the, out in, in the yard it's or on trash. the street. It's legally the trash. Okay, they was... threw it out in the streets, like not like in the streets driving, mm -hmm. because we had to do those. But they put it out on the sidewalks for anyone to come take. So then we had people in place that came and picked up all that stuff. And then we recycled all these things, whether they were, whether we sold them, resalvaged them, whatever the case may be. So this little 194 unit project that had no money, because remember all the housing authority's money had to go into the project. So at the end of the day, we had zip. So we needed to figure out, we needed a new turning um, lawnmower and some other things. So we did this recycling thing. Okay, so our little agency made over $50,000 on collecting yes. salvageable That's materials. Yes. yes. I mean, I think that we're trying to tell you is that in the smaller communities, it is harder and you have to think a little bit differently, but you can really leverage all kinds of different um, resources, whether they're intangible or cash or what have you, to really make these projects work and really have a whole community um, investment. These are the anchor projects, and now Barbara will be buying up other pro like other houses, individual houses. Maintenance doesn't have to do as much now as they used to, so they'll also be working on rehabbing those um, units. She's working on getting her general contractor's license as well so that she'll be able to do future projects. So it's really a catalyst for the Leesville Housing Authority, and really their nonprofit. So um, I'm so proud to be able to be up here and um, have had a, an amazing partner like Barbara Kovesky and the Leesville Housing Authority. So thank you. Uh, I want to talk about uh, two different structures of leverage in tax credit deals in rural communities. Uh, one from an income side to afford the ability to incur more debt on the property, the other from a grant side. As Holly alluded to, in, in any community really, there's certain varieties of affordable housing. There's affordable housing uh, that is associated with public housing. Holly's developments that she was speaking about or converting some of these public housing projects into the tax credit program. The developments we'll talk about are more private sector joint ventures with housing authorities of starting with new construction projects under the housing tax credit program. And lastly, I don't want to steal Anker's thunder, but in other communities, they're, they're, they're smaller, one-off things that Holly alluded that the Leesville Housing Authority was going to get into, but now they've got the capacity to go out and buy some houses around town and refurbish them, and there are other finance mechanisms other than the tax credit programs that do that. And it's the combination of, of all of these different resources that allow for a comprehensive development scheme in, in all communities, and in particular <coughs> rural communities, because sometimes it just takes a little bit of, of assistance. Um, I want to talk specifically about two developments, new construction, both that have a total development cost of approximately $8 million, and two different approaches of how to get there. Because at the end of the day, whether you're building in Faraday, Louisiana, Bunky, or some other small town, uh, once you commit to produce 40 housing units, you know on the front end it's going to cost approximately $8 million to get you there once you put in the infrastructure and the known hard cost associated with building these 40 units. So knowing that you've got to get $8 million in your budget to complete the project, there's really a couple of approaches of how you get there. They take planning with the local municipalities, coordination with housing authorities, making yourself aware of opportunities and alternative financing sources because it can be a challenge in some of the rural communities to put together the resources that, that you need to get it done. The development that we did in Faraday, uh, we started last year and our partner on that is the Faraday Housing Authority. And you'll see here at the bottom, the total development costs on this is right about seven, nine million dollars and so in how we got there. So we approached the Faraday Housing Authority and said, <coughs> We'd like to produce some affordable housing in your area. We've got the challenge in this development of knowing that when we sell the tax credits, we're only going to be able to get, in this case, $6.9 million in equity. And so we're going to have to go out and borrow at least $800,000, $900,000 in funds from a bank that was going to underwrite this to complete our financing sources. 
Well, the amount of debt that you're able to take on a property is a function of the income you're able to generate to be able to repay the debt. So a bank is going to look at this and say, before I make you an $800,000 loan, show me the rents that you're going to charge, show me the income you're going to make, show me the expenses it's going to take to operate this, how do I feel secure you're going to be able to pay me back my $800,000 loan? In these rural communities, oftentimes the, the, the average or area median income of the individuals that live there is so low that by design, the rents they're able to pay by law are inflated <coughs> such that you cannot charge these residents as much rent as you could in larger cities. So you can't take as much debt as you can't pay as back as many loans. <coughs> now, you may think it's a little counterintuitive, but in many rural communities, the rents paid under the Section 8 program or the Section 811 program, which we'll talk about here in a second, are more than the rents the tenants are, be, are able to pay without some type of subsidy. So we approached the Housing Authority, kind of discussed this dilemma with them and said, so the way that we could make this work and the way that we could partner is if you could help us by bringing some project-based subsidy into this development that will ensure that we're able to charge and collect higher rents so that we can take more debt and prove to the bank that we're a good credit risk on this $800,000 loan. In addition to the housing vouchers that the Housing Authority put in, we approached the Louisiana Housing Authority, which is a subsidiary of LHC, who administers the Section 811 program, which is essentially Section 8 vouchers that are tied to persons with certain disabilities, and what comes with that is a component part of social services. So in addition to there being a mechanism to pay rent, there's a mechanism in place that pays for the tenant's necessary social services so that tenant can live independently in these communities. Because as a management company, sometimes we have to do more to facilitate for these tenants, to coordinate their benefits, to help them get to doctor's appointments, to help them with some of the chores and daily activities around their house. So it's more difficult for us as a management company to be able to house that tenant so the Section 811 vouchers also pay a little bit more than some of the tenants would be able to pay without a subsidy. So we bundle all that together, take these higher rents, and substantiate that we can now afford our $800,000 in debt, put together our sources, and on the right-hand side are the uses. So a couple of other interesting things about this, and Holly alluded to some of this, is the city of Ferry 40 or 50 years ago had been uh, donated some land that is set vacant was overgrown, they weren't paying taxes to themselves, there was no benefit to the tax roll, and there it sat. So we approached the city, and we were talking about finding a location for the development, and they offered up this piece of land. And what we negotiated with them is, I'll tell you what do, is we will pay you for that land, whatever it appraises for, because it was given to you, we don't expect you to give it to us, we want to help out, it, it had highway frontage, there had been some commercial developments proximal to this area in the last 10 years, so we were utilizing those comps. We came up with a price of $220,000, which was a big deal to, to the town of Ferry. I mean, that, that was a pretty good boost uh, to, to their annual budget, and they were glad to get that land off of their books, back into the tax rolls, and producing income for the city. The other thing that we did is our construction contract with our, we have our own general contracting firm that, that's part of our organization, but we went and met with local subcontractors. We run ads in the newspaper. The mayor was kind enough to lend us City Hall to ha have and host these meetings, and what we do is make available to some of the local subcontractors who don't otherwise have the bonding capacity or the number of employees. These are small town contractors. They don't have the capacity to have 20 sheetrockers on staff that can come in and, and, and operate at the level that we need to operate. But we give them a, a chance to come in under some of our subcontractors, to come in under our general contracting license and perform services on these jobs. And so we look at these developments as an opportunity not only to make an impact for housing, but an economic impact. Uh, an $8 million, or in this case, $5 or $6 million construction project in a small town like that, that's a lot of money for the local economy. People are coming in and staying in some of the hotels, eating at restaurants that we bring in, some of the subcontract labor. It, it makes a, a big deal buying the local supplies from the lumber company and, and the 
roofing supplier. The rents that we were able to get for our ones, twos, and three bedrooms, you can see are, you know, I would say comparable to some of the larger communities around that area, and we were able to do that because of the partnership with the Housing Authority and the subsidy, which is the only way this deal was going to work. I mean, we, we had to have that partnership, and they were great to work with. Uh, you know, they have a lot of local contacts and knowledge. And it's like I said, so we've got new housing. We put the city surplus land back into commerce. We're going to pay taxes to generate revenue. We met with the local providers, and we're able to put together a nice development. This is uh, us breaking ground on it a couple months back. We have our, our signage up with, with our partner, in Louisiana Housing Corporation, who gave us the, the tax credits on this. This is the development under construction here. Pretty recently, uh, we're about 60% through with construction. And it's a, a development that we've built several times over. And so when it's finished here in a couple of months, this is what the final product looks like. Uh, and so as you can see, they're very nice homes. They all have two car garages. They're energy efficient. They're going to be certified under the Leeds Energy Certification Program when they're all said and done. The tenant utility bills are nominal on these things because of the way the construction of the load was, was done. Uh, they're all sidewalks from the gutter. It's a very, very nice community. Uh, we already have had tremendous response just to the construction signing off up there with people wanting to come get on the, the waiting list. Uh, we've started the process with uh, LHA in, in beginning our marketing to the disabled tenants that will come in under the, the PSH program. They take a little more paperwork to get them set up, transition with their social caseworkers and things like that. So we've got to get out that on the front end. We expect to have our first units available uh, for the tenants there, I would say end of June, June, beginning of July. And so it, it's been you know, something really, really great to be part of and it's making a, a huge impact in, in that community. The second development I want to talk about uh, is the base of River Chase in Alexandria, Louisiana. And as Holly said, Alexandria is, is not rural by the definition of rural development under our state's RD regulations. But if you look at the tax credit program from a national perspective, which it is, Alexandria is rural because the tax credit investors are investing in deals in Los Angeles and New York City and Washington, D.C. If they're going to take their funds and make available in places in Louisiana, they would consider Alexandria to be a rural investment from a real estate standpoint. And, you know, it's it's in some levels an arbitrary cutoff between, you know, a thousand people here or there determines the definition of whether you're rural or not. But in this case, this development we did about oh, six or seven years ago, what was really neat about this is the city of Alexandria was forward thinking. They had an area that was adjacent to their downtown area called the Lower Third Ward, which had been predominantly uh, a, a working neighborhood of, of people that worked in along the riverfront in downtown in the 50s and 60s when it was development, and it had started to decline. But the city wanted to keep Lower Third as a neighborhood that would continue to flourish throughout the years and service downtown and some of the businesses that were around there in its industrial areas. So they began buying up land as it would become available, land banking it, and putting together tracts of land. Uh, they also made lots of inner city investments into affordable housing and businesses by having business incubation and things like that. And in any event, they had put together one piece of property in particular that they referred to as the old Hodges Stockyard, which was an operating stock barn for many years where people came from all over central Louisiana to buy and sell cows. They had ran back this and the stockyard was still on it. And what happened in 2008, the city under the Housing Recovery Act was granted an NSP loan that they were a grant application applicant for for $2.5 million to $1.250. And approached us, we had done some other developments there and said, we have this grant that's restricted for housing. Is there something that you think you could do with that? And I said, yeah, I think we, we could do something with that. So we put in a, a tax credit application. We ended up under the 1602 exchange program getting $6.3 million in equity. We're back at our known number of approximately $8 million. How are we going to get there? So we told the city, this is how much equity we can get. We're going to get your $1.2 million in NSP funds, but we're still a little bit <coughs> short. The city had its own funds that they had earmarked for revitalization in this area. 
and they gave us a $250,000 grant of those funds to help kind of bridge the gap in our financing. And as you can see, it's kind of the opposite of the deal in Faraday. We end up with very, very little permanent debt on this one. Because we did, we're, we're charging very <coughs> low restricted rents because we've got some rent restrictions under the city's NSP grant and the Spark Funds grant. So it was really working in the opposite direction of the Faraday that we could take very, very little debt and had to get their, their grants. So as I kind of started out by saying, it's really the two ways that you get leverage in rural communities. You either have to bring extra income into the development to have more debt, because <coughs> debt is leverage, or leverage grants. It's all funds that you don't have to pay back. So we put together the sources on this. We bought the land again from the city. We put land that was out of commerce, back on the tax rolls. One of the kind of neat things about this is the old Hodges Sock one, which was a, a landmark in Alexander for years and years. They used to salvage wood and timber and beams to rebuild their new tiger encampment at the zoo. So they repurposed some of that stuff, and it was kind of neat to go see that after it was all said and done. And we helped them with the demo, and we were just going to go bulldoze it over. It was really, really little hand hewn beams and all that stuff. It was nice <coughs> construction. All right, so this was the, the city had a revitalization master plan that they had set funds for a side of board, and that's where we got the $250,000. They had about six or seven million dollars that they were going to sprinkle throughout this area, which they call Logan Third. And you can see the top right here, unfortunately, now is downtown Alexandria. And so they wanted to be sure that that area was earmarked for revitalization and that they put resources into it and they just didn't rely on the private sector to come in and redevelop what needed redeveloping for them, that they wanted to participate in this and, and fund some of the redevelopment. And so these are the apartments that we ended up building there. It was different than the houses, but we were able to put in a lot of additional amenities on this with swimming pools, a nice great community center, Ooh. a computer lab, uh, lots of social services components to it. it it's a fantastic development. Uh, it was very, very well received. We printed it up almost immediately uh, maintain a very active waited, waiting list there. I mean, it's it's really great. And so, as you can see, there were both eight million dollar kind of problems to solve. We just got there in different ways. And to be able to, to do that, you have to partner with the local municipalities. You have to involve the, the local housing authorities, city governments, local contractors, and just put it all together on a case by case basis. And if you do your homework and are able to kind of put these things together, they, they really turn out to be something fabulous for the community, great for us and everyone involved. And we've been very proud to be partners in these developments uh, and to help bring them into the situation. That's all I got. So um, we're going to do something a little bit different. I want this to be a little bit more dynamic and I'm going to look for some feedback. And instead of talking about existing programs that people have developed, or, or that have, the people have accessed. I want to talk about a program that's that's in the uh, conception phase. That we're we're writing the materials for it now, and we want to roll it out. So, uh, if I get up here and tell you about the tax credit program, and you don't like the way the tax credit program works, it's really too bad for you. But if I tell you about this program that we're developing, and you say, "Well, this and that," we're listening, and so there's a good opportunity for feedback. And we're, we're definitely in uh, high attention mode. The other thing is that we're, we're going to be talking about single family for a moment. So it's been a big focus on multifamily so far in this housing development track. <clears throat> but there's nothing about housing development that precludes talking about single family. And uh, we like that topic for this session because it fits into small communities just as well as it fits into a larger diverse urban communities. So let's, let's talk about it. So before we start though, I just want to take a little poll because I've had this sort of bone to pick with my client over this. So it's called the Neighborhood Stabilization Housing Initiative. And its goals are about reducing blight in residential neighborhoods, neighborhoods comprised of single family homes primarily. It also has a goal of achieving short term five-year periods of rental affordability for moderate income uh, renters. And at the back end of the program, those rental homes would be converted to single-family home ownership outcomes. 
So for instance, your initial renter who comes in and goes through the program is a rent to own renter, right? Uh, and of course, which is the case with a lot of these and is of particular importance to you know, smaller communities, these generate economic activity, right? So if you have any sort of development interest or political responsibility for smaller rural communities, do you have blight in those communities? Does it exist? Yes, um, we know it does, and that's why we're focused on this. <coughs> so here's my, my poll question. So right now, we, we, we started out with a different working name for the program, it was called Blight Remediation Rent to Own, right? Which I like, because I came up with it. <laughs> and we, called it we called it Burrito. <laughs> and, um, and I thought, why not call a housing program the Burrito Program? I mean, people, it'll stick in your minds like a burrito will stick in your stomach. And then there were some serious government officials who came along and said, you can't possibly call a government program a burrito program. What would they think of us? So it got renamed Neighborhood Stabilization Housing Initiative, which we call Nishi, which I think sounds like Japanese food. <laughs> so I need a show of hands. Would, would you take, would you prefer that the government call this program burrito? Show of hands. Sure. Okay. Oh, yeah. so, or Nishi. Oh, come on, Tom. So now you know the name of the program, right? Which is unfortunately Nishi. So and it's not changing. <laughs> Making a plug. So I want you to write your local government official. <laughs> Tell them. <laughs> Okay, so so let me tell you how the program works. It's pretty basic. <clears throat> In the basic program, there will be ten million dollars available. Seventy percent of this money will be set aside for. Uh, investments in properties that are located in areas that have been delineated or declared or established as blinded neighborhoods by entities of local government. And 30% won't have that restriction, but otherwise everything is the same. So in other words, what we're saying is that 70% of the money we're looking for local government to say that neighborhood is where we want to focus the money. So that's the only distinction with respect to that. Yeah. Okay, so large communities that have more resources often have areas that they can target and they have nice glossy plans that say what they're going to do. Rural communities, however, have some one-pager plans. Yep. And they don't have so the necessarily only, the only required it's a good question. Thank you, Holly. So the, que the question is how how much sort of bureaucracy is around the designation of a, of a blighted community? It's practically zero. What we're looking for is some pronouncement by the, 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 the town council or the parish council that has sort of governmental authority that says, this is a blighted area, this is our definition of blight, and these are the boundaries of it. That's all. We don't need a consultant to come in and develop some sort of action plan. We're just looking for uh, some recognition by the local government partner the people who have their boots on the ground in that area that says, yes, we understand your program, we're designating this, this is where we want the money focused, and what we're saying is that up to 70% of the money is going to go into areas that have been so designated. Yes, ma'am, you had a question? Yes, since blight is part of the definition for opportunity zones, would that be a designation if, if the community said we want this fund, these funds used in our opportunity zone? You could. You, yeah. I don't see why you couldn't say yes. We 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 decree that for that that the, the, the our opportunity zone is also a blighted zone for purposes. Well, that's part of the definition. Yes, that is exactly. part of the definition. Yes. Does the state so, yes. government you could, you could blight, Would the state government blind definition also suffice as? The state government definition that it will be in the program is. I mean, if it has an opportunity zone and you don't have the city designating it or the parish, but the state has designated these opportunity zones that have the definition of blight, does that count? 
We hadn't thought about that. So that's why we're having this conversation. Yes, it's just a resolution. It's a one page. Yes. And, and my guess is that a local uh, township or or uh, local parish council will say, this is where we want to focus. Yes, what? Uh, single family neighborhoods, what is that? Is it uh, uh, a contiguous area or is it, uh, I mean, I think, what is it? Because uh, ultimately when you look at urban and rural, well, uh, you, well one, you see, one, uh, one definition uh, to yeah. sort of answer, yeah. to, to, jump, to jump into answering your question, is that these are only going to be available for, and I haven't really even described how the program works yet, so, right. <laughs> but these are for the, the uh, rehab of blighted single family structures. And then, so it's not, uh, it's not for uh, adaptive reuse. This is, we're not looking for somebody to come along and say, hey, I've got a creative idea about how to do, you know, a motel conversion. No, we're looking for Blighted single-family residents. Many of these are, you know, homes built in the 30s, 40s, 50s. I mean, I, I have one. One of the things I did when I started working on this is I. Everybody's familiar with Zillow, right? Yeah. And it's pretty cool what they do. So I, I went to Baton Rouge and I set some parameters about. Uh, I want to see houses that are for sale for less than forty thousand dollars and not. And I'm getting them on my phone all the time, and I'm looking at them. And then, you know, what comes up, frankly, for forty thousand bucks is, it's not. I wouldn't say it's in great shape, right? <laughs> and um, and then I can sort of, I can immediately zoom in on that, and I can say, well, show me the house values around it. And what I'm looking for, frankly, as a thinking with a developer hat on, is I'm looking for a house that's going to sell for less than forty thousand dollars. That's within spitting distance of houses that are worth more than eight. Right? That's because from a developer's perspective, that's where my my security lies in that investment. It's a riskier proposition to go and buy a house for 40 and fix it up and then have and then all of a sudden have the best house on the block. Right? Well those single unit are can you include doubles? So just on this one, that's yeah, yeah. single family. Right. So it's definitionally it doesn't Well you get into legal issues yeah. if you don't have if unless they're fully demised. Mm -hmm. No, so, I just it's just a good good sort of thing. But but let, allow me to jump forward. I want to describe how the program works because that's the cool idea. Oh, by the way, there I didn't realize it when I was talking, but there's a definition of light up here that I took from HUD from actually when you are uh, achieving a national objective with CDBG, one national objective you can be achieving is the elimination of blight. And so there is discussion about what constitutes blight, and that's that definition. So this is basically how it works, pretty simple. The developer has to bring the property to the transaction lien free. So if any of you are thinking, maybe, maybe you've got, some of you are sort of entrepreneurial, uh, house flipper kind of developers, which is a, you know, one type of being a developer. It's not all tax credit developers out there. The developer goes and gets a house and brings it to the transaction to lean free. That's an important design concept. And the developer gets a rehab loan to fix the house up. That we will take that rehab loan out. So, developer goes and finds a house for thirty thousand bucks, acquires it um, without um, collateralizing the acquisition with the real estate. Understand? And then gets a, a sixty-five thousand dollar rehab loan from a local lender. It doesn't have to be local, but from a, a lender that's willing to do construction lending <coughs> that would be taken out at the completion of the construction. Where do we come in? Where we come in is we say, once that house has been rehabbed to a defined standard, which I can talk about if you like, and um, you've got no more than $65,000 of construction debt on it, we'll come in and we'll take that construction debt out. We'll pay off the construction lender, and we'll give you $65,000, zero interest, no payments required for five years. 
So that's pretty good for the developer because what the developer's got at that point is, say, $40,000 of investment for a house that's now worth probably closer to $100,000. For five years, they're not making any payments on 60% of that money. From a, an entrepreneurial, local community, house flipper, developer's perspective, that's not a bad deal. What does the developer have to do in return for that largesse, that governmental largesse? The developer now has to rent the house to an income eligible renter for five years. And that renter has a purchase option on the house. Right? So they find somebody who is 80% AMI or less, who is uh, qualified to rent the house against their own screening criteria, provided the screening criteria are legal. And in addition to getting a lease, that is renewable if every year the, uh, the renter now has a purchase option and the purchase option says that that renter can buy that house between the 48th and 60th month for 70% of the value. Make sense, right? So the renter says, that's a pretty good deal for me. I'm getting a house, I'm paying no more than an affordable rent, lesser of market or 80%, and I get a purchase option that says that between the 48th and 60th month, the fourth and fifth year, I get to purchase that house for 70% of its appraised value. Would you take that as a renter? Not a bad deal, right? It's a good pathway to moderate income, first time home ownership, right? Why is that good for the developer? Well, the developer, how much does the developer have to pay the state back if that transaction occurs. Only 35% of the money we loan them. So if we loan the developer $65,000, they pay us back $22,000, and what happens to the other 43,000? That goes as a second mortgage to the new home buyer and is forgiven provided they maintain residency for a period of five years. It's a good deal for the developer. It's a good deal for the renter, home buyer, the rent to own renter, like for a new job. And uh, it's a good deal for the state. Why is it a good deal for the state? Because we've eliminated blight. We've gotten somebody into a uh, first time home buyer home ownership position at a good equity position, right? 70% of LTV. Added it back to the tax rolls. And we got $20,000 back. So it didn't cost us 65 to do it, it cost us 22. But let's say, let's say that something goes wrong on the march to that outcome. What could go wrong? A hundred things could go wrong. But let's say that something goes wrong around the concept of the rent-to-own renter exercising the purchase option. They, they ultimately fall apart, for lack of a better way to put it. They can't transact. They can't get a loan. We thought they could. So the developer has to have an alternative. The developer in the design of this program has two alternatives. One alternative is that the developer decides to continue renting it for another five-year period. In that circumstance, the developer goes out and gets a mortgage on the house. Remember, it doesn't yet have one, just ours. It doesn't really have a proper permanent first from a commercial lender. And maybe the bank will loan them 80% of LTV, right? 80% of LTV on a $100,000 house is an $80,000 loan. They go and get that. And we want them to pay us 70% of our money back. That's 70% of the 65, which is what, 45? Something like that. We get paid back 45. We take the other 20 of our $65,000 loan, and we put it as a second mortgage that we forgive to the developer once they achieve an additional five years of rental. After that, we forgive that, we're done. You're done. What did we get? We got blight remediation. We got 10 years of affordable rental. We got economic activity. We got returning it to the tax rolls. 
and we got how much of our money did I have? Seventy percent. Not a bad outcome. But let's say the developer who couldn't succeed in getting the original rent to own renter to um, to succeed and doesn't want to stick around with this albatross of a property, just wants to sell it. Guess what? After the five-year original rental period, that developer has the option of simply selling the house on the market for what? For how much money? Market. 100% of LTV, right? 100% LTV. 100% of appraised value. So they turn around and say, we're done. I couldn't sell it to the first-time home buyer. I'm selling it to a market renter. No restriction on who can buy it. We're not necessarily achieving first-time home buyer outcome, but maybe we are accidentally. How much do we want to get paid back? 85%. Why? There's no longer any kind of restriction on the sales price. <laughs> so whatever 85% whatever of 65 is, <coughs> what, 56, something like that? We get 56 back. We immediately forgive the other $9,000 to the developer and we've achieved a whole bunch of goals, and we've left ourselves multiple pathways to acceptable policy outcomes. Pretty cool, right? So, one outcome is also that 50% of our funds are being repaid. So if we do a $10 million program, we're gonna see about five million come back. Some of that's can be repaid 35%, some of that's being paid 70%, some of that's being paid 85%, but on average, my projection is that we get about 50% back as we transact these properties through their life cycles, right? So that's 150 properties out of the first 10 million, but it's another 150 properties when you consider that the $5 million is gonna produce 75 properties, which is gonna produce two and a half million dollars, which is gonna produce 35 properties, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the layering flow gets you 300 properties for 10 million bucks. So even though your loans are 65, your net cost to the government is really about $32,000 for every one of these transactions that you're successful in. So that gets you about 300 blighted homes restored for about $30,000 a home. $20 million in economic activity. If you think about it, and you had 300 houses, each of which have five years of rental affordability, 300 times five, is uh, 6,000 unit years of affordable rental out of the program, right? Which is what, 72,000 <coughs> unit months of affordable rental? Uh, sorry, I tend to think in strange ways because I'm a housing policy guy. So I just had a few slides and a, a desire to sort of lay it out. What, what, uh, what are, how much time do we have? <laughs> yes, so then you, hold on. The initial housing acquisitions, the assumption is the developer will have the equity to make those acquisitions. Yes, yeah. yes, so I just want to speak to that. Great question, I'm glad you brought it up. So one of the ways that the, that the state government and the people of Louisiana, through the conduit of the state, have been screwed, is that uh, the state is too exposed to risk in these transactions. So one of the design principles in this is that the developer carries the risk. So let's say that the developer goes and buys a house and doesn't complete the rehab. Who's in a bad way? The developer, not the state. That's not always the case in government programs. And what we're trying to do is learn from our mistakes and design it in a way that the uh, the state is a little bit better protected from unnecessary exposure to risk, loss, and headache. So a long period of time for the developer to have that equity committed. Yes, so, the, so in case you can't hear in the back, it's a long period of time for the developer to have that equity committed. Yes, I would, I would expect that the developer might balk at having, say, on a given house, $40,000 worth of cash tied up for five years. However, six months worth of rehab, and you've got a $40,000 equity investment that's now paying you a $900 rent. That's a pretty good deal. And that $900 rent doesn't have a lot of operating costs attached to it. Single family 
homes aren't like multifamily in the same sense. So I've run a bunch of numbers. We're also doing some field testing on the concept by trying to apply the numbers to some real houses. But yes, a developer will have to have some financial capacity, but the other benefit of dealing with developers that have financial capacity is that when things go wrong, they can solve them instead of coming crying to the state and say, solve my problem for me because I'm broke. Uh, what's that? Ma'am, you had a question? Uh, two questions. One, what is considered moderate? Is it 80% or is it 120%? Moderate's 80%. Okay, and then the second question is, how long do you think before the market will correct itself? Once people start realizing that this is going on, the people that originally own the property are going to start raising that price and they're not going to want to sell for $40,000, $50,000, unless you're in a hurry. I think the program is so big that it's going to have, it's going to impact the market. But you're, you're thinking in the right direction. But there's so many blighted structures out there. It's like a sweet spot, so only have to put 30,000 in. So there's a few you're talking about. I mean, I think that there are a few like that, but 300? There's a lot of Oh, we're talking stiff. Oh, okay, okay. And we're talking rural areas, Baton Rouge. Yes, ma'am. You have a question. Do you have to have a potential homeowner qualify before you start? What are we thinking about that? What do you think? No. <laughs> I don't think you do. I think, I think obviously, maybe the answer is. When we come in and take out the bank financing, you have your certificate of occupancy. You want us to take out your construction loan. One of the conditions of that could be, do you have a rent rate? So it's it's definitely at the back end of the process. Well, we can apply yes, absolutely. Any other quick questions? Yes, ma'am. Quick question. Um, single family home. What is your definition of life? The property which exhibits objectively the property which exhibits objectively determinable signs of deterioration sufficient to constitute a threat to human health, safety, and public welfare, which requires a new scope of ordinances and requirements. So, typically, what this means is a house that, from its current condition, for sixty-five thousand dollars can be renovated. So if it's condemned, you might be out of your price, right? Okay. And I have another question. Is that after a developer develops it, how long is it in the process when it takes them to get that, um, that uh, original investment back to start the program? So developer's going to tie up his or her money represented in the acquisition the underlying acquisition cost of the blighted structure for at least five years because in all of the scenarios they transact anywhere between four years and five years our loan will balloon in the sixth year so if the developer doesn't transact by the 72nd month then we have a $65,000 loan on a $90,000 to $110,000 house, and we'll take it away from it. And we'll sell it to somebody who can transact it. Yes? Uh, is this going to be similar to the neighborhood landlord rental program? I don't know. Where, I mean, where, the, where the soft costs and interest carry are not going to be eligible? <coughs> can you answer that, so Robert? Because I don't know how, how, how landlords work. So obviously we're putting on another, so this is more of a forum to let y'all understand what's, what's eligible for rural areas. As you know, the neighborhood landlord program serves 51 parishes, as well as this will serve 51 parishes affected by the March or August floods. Uh, the neighborhood landlord program, we're doing another phase of that as well. It's coming out pretty much the same around same around amount of time in this. We are still working out the, the, the eligible takeout costs for this particular program. As you know, we're capping at 65. Where the landlord program is a higher cap per unit, we are looking at different things, including soft costs in the new landlord program. Um, but more relative to this point is that um, it's still a design phase. It's probably going to be in July or whatnot coming out. And I, I know I have a lot of questions. This is more of a this is going to be good for the rural area because I've driven and met with many mayors in different jurisdictions and municipalities. And this is a problem not only in the urban areas, but I really see that really, really needed a uh, function in the rural areas. So that's all we want to do. We want, we want your questions. We want your input. We want comments. We, we will probably have a public comment period on this. So this is a advanced preview. 
I don't usually get the, uh, the opportunity to talk conceptually with people about program design. Usually we're a little bit further along and we've ironed it all out. But we are very interested in feedback. Uh, but we are also thinking very carefully about this and we intend for it to be successful and we intend for it to be relevant. I like conceptually this notion of the and maybe the piece is not, I don't know if you talked about it yet, but in order for that developer to have the idea of, you know, trying to bring the property for five years and then 10 years that he has going and selling that market at 10 years. Um, but preparing a tenant for actual home. Yes. yes, hallelujah. No, thank you. Because we need a we need a we need a partnership or we need the, our developers to have partnerships with folks who can help them identify not tenants this time, but rent to own tenants who have a high potential for being able to transact that purchase option at the end of the five year period. Yeah, so we're gonna be offering financial literacy courses, also credit worthiness and home ownership opportunities to every individual that occupies the structure through the LMC. And we're also gonna be working out a way to collaborate with banks perhaps to find a pool of those individuals that have the necessary financing to buy, but not necessarily the credit this time, to maybe come up with an application for that. And, and remember, Marina, <laughs> no. So, did you want to mention um, Did you want to mention a portion of the rent going to the down payment? Yeah, I'm still working that. Yeah, but yes, there's the there's the conceptual possibility that uh, some portion of the rent is actually accruing a down payment investment for the buyer. 